When I was younger, I used to think that bias was a part of a dark past. A past where people gathered on the hillside with pitchforks in hand to burn down the homes of those who didn't believe what they did. I was taught that nowadays this kind of thing isn't really an issue anymore. After all, homes are fireproofed. And legally speaking, bias has been eliminated, right? Well, granted, we have made strides of progress, but often people make the mistake of believing that legal equality is the ultimate goal. Why isn't it? The answer lies within the far reaches of the past, and how even in our modern day, we cling to ancient principles. In order to fully resolve this issue, we first must understand it, for only then can we reshape the way that we see bias. Now, I'm sure many of you have been bombarded over and over again about the negative effects of bias, and how in one way or another, they're going to end up destroying the entire human race. This is thanks in part to modern media, which does an excellent job of letting us know what terrible people we are. However, it takes a lot of digging to find a cause for bias that isn't explained by history alone. As I hope to explain, bias isn't one, the root of all evil, or two, rooted in history alone. Like any teenager's love life, it's complicated. And as I cannot stress enough, we have made progress as a civilization. For example, people are no longer burned at the stake for believing that flying spaghetti created the universe. But once again, that still doesn't mean that we don't have a ways to go. As I learned when I was young, bias is technically gone, legally speaking. And yet as I've grown older, I've seen more and more of its examples in our society, which clearly contradicts this. Because bias is something like a flower, but not just any flower, raphalesia. That is, a parasitic flower native to the Philippines that looks and smells kind of like rotting flesh, but only blooms a few months out of every couple years and in very remote locations. Now within the roots of this flower of bias lies the problems of the past. Prehistorically, it was a pretty dangerous place to be a small and furless mammal, so humans evolved two main survival traits. Firstly, we are pack animals. Humans naturally form groups to better survive together. And secondly, humans possess a fear of the unknown, because statistically speaking, anything outside of your group was probably something that wanted to kill you. These traits protected us well until a few centuries ago, when the last kingdom fell and trade, a concept, began to become more important than actual physical survival, which is what these traits solved for. According to philosopher Peter Singer and his expanding circle theory, a group is best defined as those who share common interests. And as he explains, this circle of a group has expanded first to include you, and then your tribe, town, city, kingdom, country, and today, your nation. As he explains, as the group has expanded, so too have the number of people in that group who share your beliefs. And with that comes a natural trust of one another. However, the other side of this is that there's a natural distrust of those outside of your group because of fear of the unknown. And this can result in isolationism or even xenophobia. Now with the creation of groups comes the creation of a certain group mindset, the classic us versus them. According to social identity theory, yet another theory, people want to be a part of a group that is distinctive, because distinctive groups seem like the most fit for survival in people's minds. A good example would, be on the, would to be on the winning team, which of course requires the other teams to be losers. Therefore, once your group and the outside groups have been made, projections and assumptions begin to occur. People will generally associate positive characteristics with their own group while assuming negatives about the others. Other groups will seem simplistic like supporting characters while your group is capable of being full of complex protagonists. This is the stem of the bias flower and from where every other localized branch of bias comes forth. People naturally form groups and will instinctively learn as few details about other groups in order to keep their own distinctive. Because they view other groups as contenders for their own survival, and because they know so little about them, other groups seem <clears throat> inferior and a fear of the unknown sets in, which reinforces that other groups are just that, other. Now this conclusion made me wonder, should we even have groups at all? And the answer, surprisingly, is still yes, because despite all of their flaws, groups also have a plethora of benefits. For example, groups allow people with similar beliefs to bring together those beliefs and enhance their ideas. Imagine a world where you couldn't ask your dog lover friend what brand of flea shampoo they used because you were terrified that you would accidentally hate all cat lovers. Clearly, group mentality needs a balance, but that doesn't mean it's all evil. Take another example, nuclear energy. 
Sure, it could make the earth into a donut, but it also powers millions of homes in a way that is significantly more renewable than fossil fuels. Everything needs a balance. Even the word bias, which single-handedly sums up tens of thousands of news reports, isn't all that evil. Bias is simply the negative side of something our brains do every day to survive, in order to process large amounts of information, and that is grouping and categorizing data together. It would be like, imagine a world where you couldn't ask your human friend what they were doing because you didn't know if they had lungs or were capable of speech or could even walk on two legs. You couldn't even use the word human because that word associates general characteristics. So every day we hear the seemingly harmless jokes people make. We see the forgettable actions and must realize that this is only the bud of a well-rooted weed. One that has the potential to manifest and bloom in terrible ways. And one that if we are ever to truly be rid of, must be weeded from the soil of society itself. From the top-down perspective, that is, from the viewpoint of legality and paperwork, and most importantly, the DMV, bias is almost entirely gone. And yet every example points to the contrary, because bias is biologically ingrained within each of us, and no law is going to change that. I ask each of us to simply be aware of our thoughts and actions, and to try to spread the seed of this new idea. We have to attempt to understand one another rather than paint each other as two-dimensional caricatures to be beaten in a battle for survival that ended centuries ago. <clears throat> According to a psychologist, people don't want to be biased and have the power to change themselves to an extent. Therefore, we must simply promote the understanding that bias resides within each of us, whether we like it or not, combined with the knowledge on how it got there, and people will naturally self-correct. Through each of us as individuals, we can begin to improve society as a whole, and society can enforce this to protect future generations. It is only then that we can truly begin to see one another as human, and to understand rather than fear, and love rather than hate. Rather than hate. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>